and welcome to the Close the Loop podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the best marketing advice, according to Reddit, which is a social sort of a online community network. Uh, it's a website that is mostly crowdsourced, user-generated content or user-sourced content. Basically what Reddit is, if you haven't heard of that. If you want to know more about it, you can go to reddit.com and look up what is Reddit or, or see what's on there. Um, a lot of times people haven't heard of it. It might be like a generational thing, but uh, it's one of my favorite websites. And on there, uh, in the marketing community, a user asked the question, what's the best marketing advice you've ever received, right? And a lot of people weighed in. And this post got a lot of people sharing, okay, here's a quote, here's an adage, here's a thought, here's an idea, here's something that I received that I found really helpful or impactful to help marketers or help businesses with marketing. So I was going to, I decided to go through, this is a little bit of a different type of an episode to go through some of those things of advice, share them. They're not, none of them are my advice, but I will talk about the advice, maybe why you know, there's something to it, maybe why there's more that you need to understand about it, add some context. And just to focus this episode entirely on marketing advice for your business. So marketing, right? What is that? Why do we care about marketing advice? Well, <laughs> marketing has the potential to do a lot for a business, not just in generating leads, which is generally the conventional way it's looked at, or to you know, put a commercial in the Super Bowl. Marketing can do so much around helping a business reach its goals. You know, what is your business goals? What are you trying to do with your business? Can marketing help that? Well, most likely. So that's what we're going to be talking about. The other thing about advice, right? Uh, advice isn't always helpful. <laughs> so even though there could be a piece of advice, a marketing advice specifically, is it going to be, is every piece of advice going to be great for your business? Doubtful. Some pieces of advice have to be used a certain way, you know, or it could be the opposite where, you know, if you don't follow this piece of advice, there could be a chance that things go wrong. When marketing doesn't go right, what does it look like? Well, it looks like excessive spend, wasted spend, wasted resources. It gets in the way. Marketing processes that don't do anything. They don't provide any value. They just waste time. People who feel like marketing has never worked or can never work. That's sort of what happens when marketing doesn't do a good job when marketing doesn't do what it could be, when it doesn't fulfill its potential. Everything could be, you know, could go sour. Everything in business, everything in life, right, has a chance to, that there's something that goes wrong with it. So in marketing, that's usually what you'd expect to see. So when we're talking about Reddit again, this was a post that someone else posted and this are other people who commented on it. I found it and thought, wow, this is interesting. It'd be kind of cool to talk about. Um, there's also an underlying idea here, which is, is there value in you sharing your advice in communities or online or with others or in events or, you know, mentoring or helping? So the other thing I'd want to, and we'll, we'll get to this probably closer to the end, uh, mention is the value in sharing, the value in providing advice, the value in listening to the advice of others, right? There's a lot of not just meek or humble ideas there, but there could be something valuable in, in it for you in taking things that have been successful for you, or even taking your failures, taking anything that you're trying to do and sharing it and having other people share their opinions. And obviously <laughs> every business is unique. So that's one of the aspects of this episode we're gonna really talk about and focus on is that advice is advice, but how does it apply to your business? How does it become a practical thing to help you know, your business improve its marketing or its growth or its agenda or what you're trying to do with your business? So let's dive right in. We'll go with one of the one of the pieces, the very top. So Reddit is organized by ranking, right? So when someone says, you know, ask the question, what's the best piece of marketing advice you've ever received? Someone could post and say, here it is. Well, amidst all those, you know, comments or, or posts that people are commenting on, there has to be a way to know, well, which one is maybe the more popular ones, maybe which ones are more divisive, which ones happened more recently, like date. So the default, I believe, sorting system of Reddit is by rank, which is other people have voted that this submission, this comment is really good. So it goes up, right? And so it's organized by how much other people like it. So it's like a crowdsourced in a way, right? So someone posts, this was the number one highest ranked submission in regards to that question of best advice, right? So it says, when your copy or brand speaks to everyone, it actually speaks to no one. So I'll say that again, when your copy 
or brand when you're messaging, right? When it speaks or tries to speak to everyone, it actually speaks to no one. So <clears throat> this is an interesting piece of advice, right? Because this has to do with how a brand, how a company, how your company positions itself. If you say, well, could my company sell to anyone? Maybe, but you might be, you might say, well, you know, if I'm a roofing company, I really only can do service and sell to people who have roofs, right? So that again, narrows it down. You're not really speaking to everyone. You're speaking to people who have a roof. Now you might say, well, but not every person owns their roof or it has the ability to do updates to the roof. So then you're like narrowing it down even more. Okay. Well, what people can have their roof worked on, right? So when you get too generalized, too bland, too broad with your targeting. And they're talking when they say like when it speaks to everyone, um, when you try to talk to everyone and treat everyone like they're a potential customer, you ignore that someone maybe was a past client or a past customer. When you ignore that this person had a rough time in the past, maybe they had a bad experience. People want to be treated as uniquely as possible. When you treat someone like everyone else, uh, it sort of devalues that interaction. So this is probably one of the top rated advice because it's something that is fundamental, right? So fundamental marketing tips or you know, ideas in marketing that sort of are timeless, that seem to persist across most industries, most businesses, those are like the deepest sort of truths of marketing, like the, the fundamentals of marketing. And this might be close to a fundamental, and I would say probably why it was so upvoted or most ranked you know, in the suggestions is because it is something that can apply to a lot of businesses. And it is a very basic kind of concept that applies that is almost never not true. That you want to speak to people as personally as you can is an objective of marketing. Now, I think the most obvious other example of this is if you've ever been home during the day, um, sick or whatever, watching TV and turned on, you know, this is maybe back in the day. Uh, TV and you found it, wow, there's just lots of commercials for like wheelchairs and for the life alert devices and um, for like AARP and all kinds of stuff like that. And, you know, when I was a kid, I'd watch that on TV and be like, man, staying home from school blows <laughs> because there's nothing good on TV to watch while you're at home. You know, now there's Netflix and all kinds of stuff. But man, back in the day, you were stuck to whatever was on TV channels. And <clears throat> that's because the marketing you know, was taking sort of the statistically more often than not, the people who are at home are probably older, probably retired people who are staying home, you know, during the day all day. That's probably the most people who are watching TV during the day. So let's, uh, since that's the audience, let's put these kinds of ads. Now, if you've ever seen an ad that doesn't align with you at all, it can be annoying. It's very annoying, right? It's one of the reasons why marketing has the reputation of being so frustrating. <laughs> You don't want to see ads that have nothing to do with what you want or don't, what you don't care about. You just want to get, you know, ads are getting in the way of the content or whatever it is you want. People really don't like commercials between their shows because of the reason that it's getting in the way of, you know, watching their show. It becomes, you know, if they want to go to the restroom, they can just pause and go. They don't want to have to be forced to take a, you know, two minute, three minute or whatever it is break to watch a bunch of ads. So that's, that's why marketing at its best it's possibly best is like a unique experience for every single person. Now that becomes impossible. And, and here's why. If you try to market specifically to each and individual person, it becomes insanely expensive. Imagine that you're about to send a bunch of postcards, right? And you're like, well, I'm going to send it to the, the most recent hundred customers that I had. Well, would you write or create an ad, individual copy, an individual post mailer, that talks about what that customer maybe purchased or bought, talks about them, talks about the experience you had with them, mentions something that they brought up. Maybe it was a school or a movie or something that happened in a conversation with your team or with your you know, salesperson or with your rep or with your technician or with your staff. Or you know, if, if you're a dentist and they, came, they come in and your patients leave, you know, anything you talked about while they were in the chair, can you imagine putting that into each individual direct mail piece? That'd be insane. It would take forever, take a long time. And it would take a lot of your time. You'd say, well, is this worth it? Right? So at some point, personalization in marketing sort of has to back off a little bit 
and it has to meet the business where it can afford to spend the resources. Now, a business that has almost no ability to spend any resources at all is going to have probably a little bit more generalized type of marketing, a little bit more speak to everyone type. But you could still try to make it as specific as possible, like I mentioned with the roofer example, right? You know, if someone doesn't have the ability to do anything with their roof, probably not worth sending them. If they don't even have a roof, it's probably not worth sending them any marketing or doing any effort there. So you can try your best to try to put your marketing, your messaging, your best foot forward, but it has to kind of align with your customers. So that's why I think this one is really good. Now, here's the second one. Using pain points and a customer's point of view to understand their experience better. So I will say it again. Using pain points and a customer's point of view to understand their experience better. So this gets at, you know, why do we care about what our customer's experience is working with us? What are they trying to solve for when we sell them something? So let's pick an example, right? So let's say that this it is, you know, a summertime and this person's air conditioning just went out and it's hot <laughs> and they are just like, wow, this is, this is unbearable. I have to fix this. I have to resolve this. I can't wait. I can't put this off for four or three or four months until the cooler weather comes. I have to fix this now. This is unbearable, right? So this is something that, these are words that maybe like the customer may be, may be experiencing. They may go, this is bad. I have to figure out if this could be fixed. I have to, I don't, I'm worried about the cost. Someone strange or different or someone I don't know is going to have to come to my house to check it. You know, what's that going to be like? Do I, are they going to come when I'm available? And when, when I'm at, do I have to take a day off work for this to happen? Uh, gosh, like, you know, do I, is this going to be something where, you know, maybe my warranty covers this? There's a lot of worries and concerns. Maybe, oh, do they take car? Do they take a check? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? There's a lot that goes through a customer's mind and that experience. And in that first five minutes, it may be different than the next 10 minutes of their experience. So being able to understand, okay, what is the problem? Pain points are things that are, what is the customer or the patient or the ideal prospect suffering through? What's like something that's really painful for them? And, it, and yeah, it's like the heat in this example and it's discomfort, but it's also cost, uncertainty, confusion, fear, anxiety, right? All those things. So how is a business going to take advantage of that? How are they going to help those problems and solve them? I've even heard marketing described as mar all marketing is is satisfying needs at the end of the day. So like to a customer, that's what it's trying to do. So those are needs that need to be met, right? So the better a business understands the pain and, and the experience of its customers, the better it can try to position itself to solve them, which is why I think this one at number two is very important or ranks up there really high, you know, understanding a customer's point of view is helpful, especially when you craft marketing, right? You could say things like, we position ourselves to help customers so that they don't have to take the day off, or we have very, we have lots of available, lots of availability at all different times of the day, or some of the things that we can do, uh, allow for us to come and help you with people who have masks and are protected and are, secured and our background checked, or, or there, there's lots of things a customer may have anxiety about. So you can consider mentioning those or positioning them. Now, here's the thing. Most of these advices have a limit or have a, a point in them that becomes an issue. Let's say you come up with a list of like all of the things I just listed, and there's at least eight of them, eight pain points right there. Should I put all eight solutions in one ad? <laughs> Can I even fit all of those into a single ad, right? An ad has to capture someone's attention. It's what, it, it's what marketing or an ad, maybe a, a post direct mail, something that is um, positioned itself in front of a customer and customer visitor, potential customer, right? Is all the messaging, all the visuals. So can you communicate all eight of those things succinctly without confusing them and still position yourself in the right way? You may say, here's all the things we help with, but it doesn't actually say what you actually do. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's very easy to take this too far. So maybe you focus on one or two of the top pain points or two or three or, or the ones that best align with your business and focus on those. And so that's what you become. Your reputation is that's what you become really good at. Your unique, let's say, value, your unique proposition come, can come out of the types of things that, cust that your types of customers are dealing with. I've heard of dentists who 
their main marketing pitch is, look, we use gas. Like we, we help people who have anxiety about the dentist. That's the thing we do the best. And anyone who has issues or anxiety with the dentist has fears about that can, can go, Hmm, I'd rather go to a dentist like that. Maybe spend a little more than one that I'm terrified and, and worried that they're going to judge me or say something. Or, or when I see, you know, the tooth drill or scraper, I'm going to freak out, you know? So those are the types of things that really can set a business uniquely apart. And that's why I believe this one, number two is pretty, pretty high up there and pretty important. All right. So here's number three. <clears throat> Customers are now marketers. Customers who leave a review, who like, comment, post, put tags, shares, etc. They're more like user-generated content now. So there's a little bit to this. It sounds a little confusing, but here's basically what I'm hearing here. That customers generating content for a business could be considered the, the next wave of marketing. And that's pretty important. Um, reviews are a really good example of this, right? If customers are leaving reviews and talking about your business, other customers will see that. And that's sort of like marketing. Other customers look at reviews more often than not, especially when they're looking at a business. Well, how is this, how are other customers finding this business? What are, what experiences are other customers having with this business? You know, are, are they saying things that would scare me away? Like for instance, some customers may be saying repeatedly, you know, they're more expensive, but they're worth it. They're more expensive, but they're worth it. But if you're very, very price sensitive, you may say, well, you know, I just can't, I have to take more risk. You know, I can't, I can't be all on quality. I have to take a little more risk. And so I have a cheaper price. Things like that happen. And they guide the customer in their research phases of deciding who's going to be the one they call or who's the one that they give a chance to. You may see a couple of reviews where it's like, this business is really hard to get a hold of. And you say, you know what? I don't care. I have lots of time. I'll just call them over and over again. But someone else may be like, look, I have just 10 minutes at lunch to call a business, get something booked, and then I go back. So I really need this to work. So that might scare them away, right? There's lots of unique things like that that can come from user-generated content. You can ask people to you know, leave a review. Great. You ask people for testimonials, recorded video testimonials. You could take pictures of job sites, uh, pictures of you know your dental practice, pictures of your business, what, you know, what your employees are doing, uh, your employees can share, you know, I love working here. This is a great experience. It helps you with hiring. There's a lot of potential for, let's say a business to generate content on a different way than they've ever done before, which is considered user generated content. It's very interesting. And it's sort of daunting because you're like, well, how do I, how do I get a, a customer to, you know, get on video? How do I ask them for a review? How do I do any of this? And that's pretty daunting, honestly. It's it's tough. It's also, you know, you're like, well, does my plumbing company have to now be sort of like a production company? Do we need to have cameras and video? And I need to train everyone to take pictures and ask permission so I can, you know, post on social media or post out there. Here's, you know, a successful job done or put it on my websites, like some recent projects or, you know, just how do I prove to people that I am what I say I am? which is a lot of times what content's all about. And that's, that's difficult to get to. So that's one about this, like, yes, user generated content's amazing. <laughs> is every business able to pull that out of their pocket every single time? Is it really that easy to get? Yes and no, right? Like some businesses have a great reputation and, and have a good relationship with their customers and it's not so bad. So that one is so powerful, but also ha can be very difficult. And, when it's like, well, maybe just once a year is enough. I don't know. You know, the, the wave of user generated content, it seems to be that it's satisfying the needs of consumers who are researching and the more the merrier, right? The more reviews they see, the more responses to reviews they see, the more videos, testimonials, images, experiences shared, the more sort of raw experiences that they're seeing are really leading to consumers being like, this is, this is so much better than a business that doesn't do it at all or doesn't do it as much. And it helps them stand out. So how important is it to stand out? You know, that's the difference between more customers and less, higher quality customers and less quality customers typically. So it could be very impactful for marketing. All right, so now we've gone through three. Okay, so um, now I want to touch on 
you know, there's something about I haven't mentioned, which this was advice posted by random people on the internet into this question on Reddit and other people, again, random people, again, voted it, some of these suggestions and pieces of advice up to the top. So if you think about it, can we really trust any of the things, any of the advice from random strangers on the internet, right? It sounds a little bit sketchy. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? Whenever I'm going through anything, any piece of advice, I'm trying to help you understand my take on it. But it's also really important. You have your opinion on it and what you think. Advice from other people, whether you trust it or not, sort of like a, a trust limitation you, that you may have. Is it possible you can learn something that you didn't know before from someone totally random on the internet? Sure. But the world, the internet especially, is just overstuffed with advice. <laughs> so how do we figure out whether the advice is important, worthwhile, helpful, right? Not just going to waste our time. Like I've, um, something happens a lot of times when um, companies go to an event or they read a book or attend a webinar, right? They go, they hear something new and interesting, and it's in this great environment. And everyone's like, yeah, this is amazing. This is helpful. Like this advice is fantastic. This will help me transform my business. And then they come back, they come back into their business, they walk in and they maybe share that with their team or they think about it a little bit. And then they, they kind of feel like maybe it's not as good as I thought it was, you know, or six months down the road, they look back and go, why didn't I, you know, why didn't I do anything with that advice? It seems so helpful and so good. Why didn't I apply it? <laughs> Why didn't I do anything with this advice? It's because advice is sometimes really hard to apply. It's also, you know, some things just help us feel better. Some things are not our advice that we hear and just sort of confirms our confirms like exactly what we were thinking, what we thought. So it's like, yeah, this is great. I feel better because it just confirmed what I already knew. <laughs> so that's why advice can be sort of difficult and hard to weed out and, and really, really valuable or good advice. You have to take it and go, how does this really apply to my business? How could this change my day to day, right? My week to week, my month to month. Can this even help me improve my goals? What's the cost to get this going? What are the requirements? They may say, follow these five steps and your business will double in, in, you know, in a year. You go, oh, wow, double. That sounds great. But you look at the steps and the requirements are just things that you can't do, you can't have. You just can't put into practice. So that's sort of how we should be evaluating advice as well. And I think how a business can sort through some of the craziness. There's a ton of books on business, right? <laughs> There's a lot of events, a lot of um, speakers, influencers, people out there that can guide your business in the right directions. But how do you really figure out what's great from what's just mediocre? That is very difficult to do. So with that, we'll kind of go right into the next one. Number four. New customer acquisition is the goal. So think of retention as a way of paying for it. I'll read that again. New customer acquisition is the goal. Then think of retention as a way of paying for it. So this is sort of similar to that. I don't know if you've heard this uh, idea that keeping a customer is a lot cheaper and a lot more valuable than trying to find new customers. So retention is holding on to the customers you've already worked hard to get, right? So the goal is oftentimes, let's get new business in here. Let's get more new revenue, more, you know, sometimes a business, uh, a customer doesn't need your services again for a while. So let's get more new ones. That's, that's a lot of times probably the most common goal in a business and in, in its use of marketing is in finding the, filling its new revenue stream new customer stream, new acquisition, right? How do you get new acquisition of anything in your business? So that's, that is often the goal. So, but what you do with those customers you acquire or what you do with the leads you get, what you do with the opportunities you have, you know, you work so hard and spend so much to get this person on the phone or get this person to set an appointment with you or get this person in your office or, you know, or get this project paid for and you're finally there. And then, what, what happens? Does the ball drop? <laughs> and that could be so much worse because you have to total up all the resources spent up to that point, right? Maybe th this person was a customer in the past and they come back and you treat them like they're just totally different and new again. That could That's a lost opportunity right there. And so focusing 
I, I, it almost sounds to me like this one's focusing on segmenting, segmentation. Now for marketing purposes, segmentation is when you take groups of your consumers, prospects, clients, anything, you separate them into more homogenous, very similar groups, like all the clients, all the prospects, all the leads, everything separated, right? Maybe clients that uh, you had six months ago, clients that you just finished a project last month, and you may have maybe messaging, marketing, something designed for that specific group. And so each group you make, you've decided I'm going to message them or have a unique messaging, positioning, something for that group. You know, like maybe this group is for these types of products and this group is for that type of products. That's what segmentation is. So this one is all about, you know, this, this one, when, you know, new acquisition is your goal. So new would be new leads, new business, something like that. Maybe selling a new product, if that's the goal. Also, it's equally important to wonder, not only how are you going to get them to that goal, but what are you going to do with them after you've done that? right? How are you going to turn them into repeat customers, stuff like that? That is also very important. And probably why this one is upvoted so much is that if you just focus on one segment, right, and ignore all others, you kind of do so at your payroll. So that's fascinating. And that's also a very common marketing foundational concept. Uh, I've heard that a lot. So that's a good one. Number five, in most online businesses, attributing revenue based on last click is like allocating sales to the left and right doors of your shop. <laughs> okay, I'll say this one again, because some I wanna make sure you understand what it is. Some of these are like more than a sentence. In most online businesses, so online businesses, attributing revenue based on last click is like allocating sales to the left and right doors of your shop. So this is a little bit more of a complex one. So let me, let me just break it down for you. What it's trying to say is if you are attributing revenue back to like a channel or a campaign. If you're saying this campaign drove this revenue, anytime you say this thing did that, right? Cause and effect. Let's say this ad that we ran two weeks ago is what led to this sale today, right? What it's saying is if you look at just the last thing the consumer customer did, then you're misattributing it. You're doing it wrong. So let's say you ran this, you ran an ad a month ago. And then you ran an ad, a different ad two weeks ago, and then you ran another ad today. And let's say from the ad today, you got a couple signups and you thought, wow, the ad we ran today is so good, so great, <laughs> right? But it could be this person saw the ad a month ago, clicked on the ad two weeks ago, clicked on the ad again today, but converted today, right? So that's the miss and mix and problem and issues all wrapped up in attribution. So one of marketing's greatest struggles, one of its most difficult and hardest to solve problems in all of marketing is being able to say, I put a dollar in here and I got three, five, ten dollars out over there. That's it. That's like the hardest thing to do because it's because consumer behavior is so crazy. Is it the direct mail piece that you sent to their home, the thing that really caused them to want to do business with you? Right? That's always very difficult. Some people think, well, none of the marketing is having really an influence, so I don't do marketing at all. But that's also not true. Right? It's very, very well studied, scientifically proven that there's a saturation effect, that marketing does have an influence. In fact, it can be great. There's a, a lot of robust research and insights into the impact and influence of marketing, and it's, and it's high. It, it impacts people's, every aspect of people's lives. There is a, a lot of opportunity in marketing to influence a business and it, it can be it can be dramatic. So the funny thing about this one, right? Last click is, a, is making is allocating sales to the left and right doors of a business because, you know, it could be the ad they saw and then their friend told them about it. They looked online, saw the good reviews and were like, OK, I, now I'm willing to go down to the business. So all those things have had influence. They get to the business and they go through the doors and someone's at the doors is like, aha, the doors are. The, the doors is what got them in, right? Um, that's why it's it's making a kind of a funny joke about it. And also describing how silly it is to say that the last thing someone did is the entirety of all the impact and influence marketing has had on that person, right? That's equally silly, <laughs> but it's a little more complex because it requires some understanding, which hopefully you have now about why last click attribution can be silly. Now, it's still important. It's sort of like uh, something that's interesting to know, but it's not the end all be all, you know, in, in terms of like, if you pour, if you have a hundred dollars 
And the last thing someone did is come to the door to be like, wow, I'm just going to make my doors really fancy instead of spending money on the ads and everything else that brought them to the doors. I'm just going to spend all my money on the doors because that's the last thing they did. So you have really fancy doors in your shop, right? That's why it's, it's a sort of a metaphor of attribution and taking and considering things incorrectly. By the way, last click is the terminology for when you take the last thing that someone did in attribution in a marketing touch or influence and give the allocation of, you know, this is what caused that. This, this door is what caused the revenue, right? There's other models like first click. What's the first thing they did? There's other things like let's give value to all the things they did. There's lots of different types of modeling for that. And that's why it's one of the struggles of marketing. One of the things that is most difficult to solve for. Every by default, everything is last click because it's it's very clear. Here's the last thing you know. You saw someone come through the doors. You're 100 percent sure they did that. So that's why it's it's generally the default attribution model because it's accurate, right? We can see that they did that. We may not be able to see all the things they did before because of privacy and other issues, and we don't know. We may ask them, "What you know when they come in the store? Well, what brought you here today?" And they go, "I don't know." They forgot or they don't want to tell you. You know, you know, if you ask someone on the phone, how did you find us or hear about us? Like they, they're just going to say something or say, I don't know. You know, like most often they, they're not going to remember everything they did. So it's very unreliable in terms of things to, in terms of the entire marketing mix to associate that. Um, so anyways, that's why that one is very interesting and probably why it's a reminder why that one is, you know, voted fairly high. Um, hundreds of people voted on these types of things. So why people thought this is a good thing that everyone should know. Let's stop for a second again and go, okay, so far, is there anything that could be applied to your business or what you do, you know, or, or consider like, how is, is there any similarity to anything so far, any piece of advice that you've heard that you're like, that's pretty good. Or maybe something you're like, that's garbage. <laughs> that has nothing to do with me at all. So that, that's really important. Um, be, be thinking about how, how this applies to you. And then the next thing is, there's a question I'd have, right? Is it good for a business or someone, let's say someone's just about to start a new business, to be really dependent on the advice of other people? Like if they just start a new business, they've never done that before. They don't know all the mistakes that they're going to make. You know, like if they were to say, fast forward me 30 years, you know, that wiser, older, experienced version of themselves, of their business is going to know, has a lot of learnings and failures and successes throughout the time. Right. And also there's just a different time frame. Someone who started a business 10 years ago, you know, is going to ha have different struggles than, than a business that starts out today. So how dependent should we be on advice? Right. People, some, I know of people who soak up everything. They take all the advice to the full extent they possibly can all the time. And there's a problem with that where, you know, some advice doesn't make sense anymore. It has to be applied to this business and does it. It has to be applied to this situation. Can it be? Another area of issue is someone who ignores all advice. <laughs> someone who's like, I'm just going to figure it all out on my own. I'm not going to take any advice from anyone else. I'm just going to figure this out. I'm tough enough. I'm strong enough. I can handle it. And there is an issue with that as well, because there is value in wisdom and experience from other people. It, it varies and you have to be able to just dilute down or filter down. Okay, here is the gems in what I'm hearing. You might read an entire book on how to run a business and only take out a couple things and go, you know, I got a few things out of this. And I think that that's perfectly fine. So the idea that we want to be not entirely dependent, but still have, you know, leave the doors open, like still stay humble and meek and, and keep the door open for to learn something because we don't know everything. That's what this is all about. I don't know everything at all. I'm sharing my opinion on some of these things to tell you, like, you know, this is how I'm seeing it. But there's lots of very interesting things that can come out of sharing uh, advice that you have with other people that may go, you may say, here's an experience I had. And they go, this is great. And you talked about this and that. But, you know, while you were saying that, this other thing popped in my head and it has nothing to do with what you said, but it's going to help me. You're like, well, that's great. <laughs> I'm glad it helped you, even though it has nothing to do with what I said. You know, things like that happen. So, OK, we'll go to the next one. This one's about content. Content without reach is like building cathedrals in the desert. Again, content without reach is like building cathedrals in the desert. <laughs> I love how some of these are written. This is great. Okay, so content, right, is blog posts, videos, uh, 
website pages, website articles, a web page that helps people with a calculator, let's say, like figure out how much you know something's going to cost. A tutorial you may post on social media. That's content. So content, but making content, but without reach, right, is like building cathedrals in the desert. So what's reach? That's reach is describing the people, the eyes, those visitors, those targeted people that you want to read it, <laughs> to consume the content. It's sort of like another way of describing this one is like baking all this great food without anyone to experience it or taste it is like, you know, throwing all the food that you've made right into the trash. That's kind of what it's saying. Now, there's still value in making content. So it's not entirely true here. It, it's just making the distinction that if you don't have a purpose for the content that you're producing to reach people, to be able to put this content you've made in front of people, that's a problem. So whenever you make content, you've got to have a plan and how this is going to reach the people you want it to reach. You don't just go, wow, we're going to make the best video ever, but then never publish it so anyone can actually see it, right? Just stays in a flash drive or on your computer. That's a waste. That's wasted. So that's building a cathedral in the desert. Like you may have this amazing palace, but no one will ever be there or go there because no one can. No one, no one even knows that it's there. So content without some spend or without efforts to help that content reach the right people is waste. And the most common place that this shows up, right, is is from field agnostic or, or field um, experiences in the field that come back into marketing. So for instance, let me, let me explain this. Someone who works in the field, maybe a salesperson, maybe someone who's a project manager, a coordinator, someone who deals directly with the customer or whatever. They may go out, talk to, or have an experience with them and go, man, this customer said it'd be really helpful if we had this, you know, uh, if we had a video showing them how to do this. And so they come back and tell marketing, yeah, let's make this. And marketing makes it and says, here you go. Now, anytime someone says, you know, do you have a tutorial on how to make this? You can share it with them. Well, what sometimes happen is, <laughs> They don't remember they have the video, you know, they forget about it and, or they don't get asked about it for a long time. And then the video literally goes nowhere. <laughs> uh, you look at some, what happens on a lot of calls to your business and it may say, you know, I was looking on your website, but I didn't see any pricing. I don't know how much things cost. And you go, hmm, let's put this on the website or let's put this, let's, let's give a link to the people on the phone so that they can share this. And then what happens is those people forget about the link or don't know where it is or <laughs> it never gets shared or never gets found or the pages aren't easy to find. And so the page gets, you spend all this time and resource to make the content and then it goes nowhere. <laughs> you know, in marketing, it's, it just feels terrible to put time and resources research to get everyone approved on checking everything off, you know, and making sure this thing looks good. It's on brand. It's going to be helpful. You put a lot of time into this and then uh, no one, no one sees it. No one knows anything that's going on with it. It's a complete bust. So that happens way more than it should. Um, unfortunately. So if it was me, I'd put this one a lot higher. <laughs> um, this one was really good. Probably one of my favorite, you know, content without reach is like building cathedrals in the desert. Probably one of my favorite pieces of advice, especially for, for companies who are wanting to, to make more content, but really haven't thought through, well, how are we going to get eyeballs on this content? Right. <laughs> All right. Next, allocating marketing budgets between channels, hiring staff, buying stock are all about taking risks with cash. Learning how to mitigate risk as you grow will tell you how to proceed. So why is this one a marketing piece of advice? Read it again. It's kind of long. Allocating marketing budgets between channels, hiring staff, buying stock are all about taking risks with cash. Marketing is like is all about taking risks with cash to some extent. So learning how to mitigate risk as you grow will tell you how to proceed. Here's my take on this one. It's saying that marketing, right, is a risk. There's some risk in marketing. You could be spending that money elsewhere. So why would you spend it in marketing? Well, because marketing has the potential to take a dollar today and give you four, five, ten, hundred dollars from that single dollar, you know, maybe not tomorrow, but down the road. So it's an investment, right? So risk reward is basically the, the adage for investment. So the higher the risk, generally the higher the reward. But in marketing, it's not always exactly the way it is. Um, so as you, as a business invests some of its capital into marketing, it's hoping for, right? 
<laughs> as much as it can hope, as many as well as it can hire the best people, the best agency, the best support, you know, put its f best resources and processes and capabilities into marketing. It's hoping that every dollar and every bit of resource it puts in there, that the processes will turn into a tremendous multiplier of value at the end, right? So that the return on their investment will be substantial. Because otherwise they could have just taken that money and invested it somewhere, you know? It's like, oh, I could put this money in a place for 10%. So we think about it, you're like, well, if I could put it over here for 10%, then for marketing, I need at least, let's say 11, 12 or 14%, you know, depending on the type of risk it is or the type of return that is possible there. So those are just economical things that it uh, is probably more suited toward the owners and business owners than anyone else. Because it's trying to convince them to just put some capital, some cash toward marketing than to put it somewhere else. Now, that's that's not just marketing. That has to apply to every department, right? Every department has to be considered whether it's ROI is. And there are profit centers, which are things like marketing, where you put money in and it's expected that the money you put in will grow. And there are also things that are set up like cost centers. A cost center in a business is anywhere you put money in and you don't expect any money to come back, but it's like an essential operational cost. Sometimes I've heard accounting is, is viewed this way, right? The business has to be able to collect the cash, you know, receive it and make payments and then be able to deposit it. And someone needs to keep track of that. And their goal is not to, you know, somehow swindle it into much more money, you know, like in a legal sense, they're expected to just do that function operationally. And there's nothing tied to their, you know, take this dollar from the customer and print two out of it. It doesn't work like that. It's just keeping things accurate and accounting for them. And that's why that that department is oftentimes looked at as like a cost center, but an essential, right? That's usually what cost centers are. They're essential. Otherwise, why would you even have it? <laughs> why would you even do it if it's just a dump? If it's just, you know, money is being literally poured in a fire. So that's not what's happening uh, in a cost center. Profit centers are ideal the way to set up departments. Not everything can be set up that way. The actual goal of that department, the key performance, the measurements, everything around that department is set up to be profitable. The dollar in, you know, you spend it on, you have to total up your labor costs, operational costs of that department, everything, you know, the total investment in has to be less than the return from them. And that's a profit center. And that's what it's trying to say here, I believe, is that marketing has to be looked at as an investment and as a profit center. There's a lot of risk there. Yes, let's not, be, let's not kid ourselves, but there's a lot of potential return, except especially when people who, you know, you employ people who know what they're doing. And there's a lot of like intelligence capital or wisdom or experience capital, a lot like, a, like the advice here. There's a lot of value in people with experience coming in and being able to help your business grow. Next one, it's a quote. And I like this one. Quote, the second you try to sell something, you're doing it wrong. Close quote. I'll read it again. Quote, the second you try to sell something, you're doing it wrong, close quote. <laughs> this is a very good, almost like something you'd put on, on a post-it note on your computer whenever you're about to write anything, right? Don't make everything in, that you say a sale. Before someone's willing to buy, they have to see the value. And the other thing they have to, so have you ever heard of no like trust, right? So they have to know that there's value. They have to like who you are. And they ultimately have to trust that they're going like the, the risk or that the return, that there's some confidence in achieving whatever it is with, with what they're buying from you. Right. So if they're buying a, a clog, declog of their pipes, right. Do they know that you can do that for them, that there's value in that? Yes, because their, their drain is probably clogged. And do they see that you have the equipment and that you're, you're capable and you've been around for a while? Yes. Do they like you? Maybe not yet, but they want to, right? They hope that, you know, the experience you provide is helpful, is courteous, kind, is is going to give them the assurance that, okay, these people know they're not just scamming me, <laughs> you know, they're not just like running a drain clog scam or something. And then trust is what comes at the end of the day, sometimes after they've purchased and they say, okay, yeah, these guys did do what I asked them to do in the way that I wanted and expected. And so that's why, you know, a lot of times a business comes down to like providing its value first and the sales later. And it's a, it's a positioning, you know, if you say buy this versus here's how this helps you, it's a very different, you expect a different reaction. If you've ever been sold to hard, you know, that it's kind of an uncomfortable situation. You feel like you're being pressured, right? There's peer pressure or that there's, 
like you feel like you're an idiot if they don't do what they say, or you don't feel cool if you're not wearing the latest thing, or there's lots of weird ways that sales makes its stamp in a negative way. Now it could be very positive. Uh, generally sales is in a positive way. The best way I've heard sales described is we're helping people. That's it. That's what sales is. <laughs> so how do you help people? Well, you understand their needs, their problems, their struggles, and then you help them. Right. And, uh, as a sales for any company, you only have a few options to help them. But if they've come to you or, for, you know, if there's anything, any opportunity there, you can sniff it out without it coming across like you're just there to, you know, dig in their wallet and get out. <laughs> That's why I like this one. Okay. Um, an expense, an ex, because of time, I'm just going to quick, like, name a few more because these ones are getting down to the less ranked ones. And just say a few things and then we'll kind of close out. So next one is follow-up. That's gold. Without following up, even the customers may forget that they need something from you. Very important to follow up, right? A one touch, one call, any kind of single interaction close is very likely and very possible in a lot of businesses. But if you follow up, if you retarget, if you remarket, if you you know have follow up calls, follow up interactions, the chances of you getting that business goes up a lot. Brian Dice from Digital Marketer has a quote that says, the company that spends the most to acquire the customer wins. If you think about that, you know, oh crap, I don't want to spend the most. But when you win the customer, you win it and other people lose it. So there's value in that, right? So following up is very critical. Next, talk to your customers. <laughs> the next one, which even goes along with it, you are not your customer. So talk to your customers, you're not your customer getting to know your customer and their pain points, like we mentioned earlier, that's why these things tie in, is very, very helpful. And if they say something, sometimes a customer will say something, you're like, I'm gonna use that quote on the website, <laughs> or I'm gonna put that in the video, or that's really powerful, I bet. I've heard that before, you know, things like that. Customer research is very hard to get sometimes and, and feels difficult, but again, just like we mentioned earlier, there's value in it. Um, I like this one. You can persuade your customer to the degree you understand them. I'll say it again. You can persuade your customer to the degree that you understand them. So persuading a customer is valuable, right? <laughs> you want them to take an action. There's something you want them to do. So how do you persuade them to do that? Well, you do that best when you understand them better and where they're at in that moment. That's what helps you. And that's very valuable for marketing. Obviously, it's a crystal. Marketing is not a crystal ball. There's no silver bullet. There's nothing here that's going to like, 100x your, your business just in and of itself. It has to apply to your business and you won't know everything. So you have to, you know, you, yes, you want to be exactly and know exactly where your customers are at, but you're not going to. You're going to know maybe, right? So you do your best. That's, that's a lot of what marketing is, is trying, testing, applying over and over again. So I love this one. Blame anything that goes wrong on seasonality. <laughs> uh. Blame the problem on something else, right? Anything that goes wrong in marketing, just blame it on something. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, unhelpful, right? When you don't know, when you don't have the feedback or the knowledge of what really happened. Maybe it is seasonality was the cause, <laughs> um, but it's also possible that you know there's other things that went wrong. So I just leave it at that. And last, I'll just say this is the last one. All right, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And I think this is a good one to end on because marketing. When, when you try to do everything in marketing perfectly, you're wasting time. Don't do that, <laughs> right? The only time I can possibly see that making sense is like a Super Bowl ad. You have one chance to get it right, right? And so in that sense, it's got to be done really, really perfectly. You get one chance. But a lot of times a business can deploy an ad, a social post, something, and then say, okay, maybe this worked and maybe this didn't. Let's try something else or let's deploy an A-B test or let's, let's just ask people what they think of this before we run it. Things like that is how marketing really should be done. If you put a ton of resources designing something without testing it first, it could go wrong, okay? <laughs> so just test something simply. Just put the bones together and get it out there. Just get things out, get things made, get things going. And then you have the opportunity to learn from them. And then all of a sudden you, you arrive at a really near perfect version of your marketing and you can run it. And then after that, you take your learnings and apply them in another thing, go forward. That's how it's done. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So that's a very good one to end on. <clears throat> Again, advice from other people who we don't know, complete strangers, post it on Reddit. 
So that's where I got this. If you're curious about Reddit, you should go check it out. Go look it up. Go see what it is. A lot of these are tactics, so they have to fit into the complete business and marketing plan that you have. In and of themselves, they're probably not that amazing. But some of the things that I mentioned today in the marketing advice could be very helpful for a business where that does align, if it can align. So really figure out when and where you can apply any piece of this advice to your business and you'll be better off. Or maybe as a marketer, you know, maybe some of this, all of this you've heard before. So I'd say to all that, if you have advice, if there's something you'd really, really like to share, something you find, you know, here's a piece of marketing advice or business advice that I've heard that's really helped me. I really encourage you to share it, put a video together, maybe go comment on, on this somewhere, anything you can do to, to take any information, knowledge and share it because it's so valuable in sharing it that other people can benefit from it and that it helps you too, because we don't know everything, right? So let's keep pushing forward and keep trying things. Thank you for listening to the Close the Loop podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Dini, and I hope you stay tuned for next time. Thank you. Bye.